Hey, Damon DeMarco here for createx3.com. Thanks for stopping by. Today, uh, we're going through the mailbag. I have a student here. Uh, I'm going to, this is a printout of their uh, email to me. For privacy's sake, I'm going to call him Frank. And Frank is a uh, person who bought my Break Your Story course, which is a story based course where I teach you essentially how to deconstruct to reverse engineer stories and to do that first so that when you go to write your story you're not like a lot of writers get lost in the wilderness do you know what i mean by that a lot of writers and i was one of them so i'm speaking completely from experience here we have an idea right and we get very excited about this idea we have an impulse to write and uh that's great uh and and uh there's a lot to be said for the impulse to write but at the same time there's a lot to be said for not launching into it right away. There's a lot to be said for developing the idea to break the story, meaning really hash out what the story is about so that you have a framework so that when you launch yourself into it, you don't hit that dreaded wall where you're 40,000, 50,000, God forbid, 100,000 words into something and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. There's really no worse feeling in the world. And uh, if you're like me, you've had a lot of projects go that way throughout the entire course of your career, and they stalled, and years went by like that, and you've got a drawer full, or you've got uh, hard drives full of material, and none of it's really come to anything, and it can be very discouraging, it can be very damaging to you as a writer, until you learn the technique goes a long way toward helping that. Everybody's got talent, I, I believe that, and everybody's got drive to a certain degree. Talent and drive, however, do not get you through a, a book project. They don't, or a film project, or a television pilot, or a theater piece. They just don't. It's talent, it's drive, and it's technique. Without technique, talent and drive are just like water, and you pour it out onto the table, and it runs all over the place, and it's no good to anybody. Technique is what gives shape to your talent. I'm sure in the responses to this and in my email box, I'm going to get a lot of people kicking back and say that I'm completely wrong. Fine. Tell me that I'm wrong. But what I found is that for some writers, a lot of writers actually, this technique of breaking a story first, doing the work up front, front loading the, the work of character and plot and theme and premise and all of that, means that you, you it's I'm, I'm not sure if you can see it from this side right it's it's like you do all the work up here that you climb the mountain first and then you skate down on the other side rather than climbing the mountain steadily like this and getting um uh, further and further away from what you want to accomplish and also getting lost in the process does that make sense front loading the work is a better way of writing a story that's when, when I change that in my own mind, when I changed it in my technique, then things start to get done left and right. Bing, bang, boom, zoom, stuff flying out the door, stuff getting bought, that kind of thing. Okay, so that, that's why I'm trying to look out for you here, and that's why I'm offering uh, not only the course, but uh, this advice, uh, so that you don't do what I did for a long time, which is to get really, really lost in your writing um, and get really discouraged. You don't want that. Mm -mm, not good. Okay, so uh, here in the mailbag today uh, from Frankie, it says, Hi, Damon. I love the course. I am, lot, I am like a lot of writers that get stuck with story structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Learning the structure of stories, etc., has really helped. Good. I have really struggled with the premise statements. I'll go back to that in just a second. I see the value of them. I have practiced writing premise statements, but I just can't get the hang of them. Take the Karate Kid, for example. Well, we're going to do that today. We certainly will. After a boy moves to a new town, Frankie writes, he, this is where I get lost. He has a bully and he meets a karate master and I don't know. I end up with the same problem with my own premise statements. Help, please, sign Frankie. Okay. Well, uh, Frankie, this is actually not a terrible problem. And I'm really glad that you wrote in and asked me this because it gives me an opportunity to kind of redefine, first of all, what a premise statement is and why it's important and where we're going to go from there. 
A premise statement is a really a one sentence description of your entire story. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a novel, it doesn't matter if it's a screenplay, it doesn't matter if it's a television pilot, it doesn't matter if it's a stage play. The one sentence description that you would give to somebody saying, when they say, hey, oh, I, you're writing something, uh, what's it about? You pitch them with it in one sentence and keep that word pitch in mind because when you're pitching a story to somebody, a publisher, uh, studio executive, somebody, a producer, somebody might buy your product. You want to have your story nailed down in such a way that you can sell them, hook them on it instantly. How do you do that? You, you write a good log line, essentially. It's a technical industry description for a one sentence description of what your story is about. So, What's in a good log line? Well, what's in a good premise statement? There are four components. Is that, that's, that's three. Okay, so let's make it four. There are four main components that I prescribe to go into a log line, and those are your protagonist, your antagonist, the inciting incident, and the objective. Let's take those apart. Okay, the protagonist you probably know from basic literature courses in high school. A protagonist is, is the hero for lack of a better word. And I use that word obviously in you know every gender sense. It, it's the main character, okay? The hero, the heroine, the, the, it doesn't matter, okay? It's the main character. You have to have somebody that the story happens to or you don't really have a story, I submit. Again, the email bag will probably be full of criticism on that. Lay on, you know, go into it, that's fine. As far as I'm concerned, you have to have a protagonist for your story. Now, yes, you can have multiple protagonists. Yes, I mean, that, that's certainly possible, but let's walk before we run. You have to have somebody, a hero that the story happens to. That hero has to want something. That's the objective. They really have to want something very badly because if they don't want something really, really badly, then what's the story about? What, 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 why would we be watching them or reading about them, right? They would just be sitting around all day if they don't want anything, and that's kind of boring, frankly. I mean, maybe if you're Andy Warhol, you could film somebody sleeping for nine hours or whatever he did and call it art. I see a place for that every now and then, but it's not a really compelling thing to write a screenplay about or a novel or anything like that, in my opinion. So your protagonist has to want something. Your protagonist has to have an objective. Now, the protagonist now is in their regular world where they're kind of unfulfilled, otherwise there wouldn't be a story if they didn't start someplace, right? And that starting place has to be a place that they really don't want to be in because if they really love that place, then there wouldn't be a, a, a need for a journey to get out of that place, and therefore we wouldn't have this thing called a story. So the protagonist is incited somehow. There's an inciting incident. Something pushes them out of their regular world to pursue their objective. It either pushes them or something happens that compels them, okay? It can happen in any number of ways. Technically speaking, we say that the hero crosses the threshold into adventure. This is Joseph Campbell speak from The Hero with a Thousand Faces, the monomyth cycle. Crossing the threshold of adventure from the normal or mundane world into the world of adventure where they pursue their objective. And they can either do that willingly or unwillingly, okay? And, and in the course, I use examples that everybody knows a lot, like Rocky uh, and Star Wars, the original uh, episode four, I think it is, A New Hope. Everybody's seen these movies, okay? And that's why I use them as examples. Luke Skywalker really wants to get off this, this terrible, dry, literally dry, it's a desert planet called Tatooine, right? He's got no friends, there's no excitement, he's, he's, his aunt and uncle are, they, they make him work on the moisture farm, he doesn't want to do that, he wants to go racing his speeder along, but he can't do that. You know, he wants to join the rebellion, right? He looks up into the sky and he sees the starfighters going up there and there's a huge battle and something is calling inside of him, which we later on figure out is the fact that, you know, his father is up there and he's the, you know, that guy. But, you know, something's calling to him. The call to adventure is there. The protagonist has an objective to get off that rock, but he can't because there's no inciting incident yet. 
the inciting incident in that story is that he meets this kindly old man who gives him his father's sword, you know, otherwise called a lightsaber, and that man turns out to be a Jedi warrior, and he says, you know, there's this huge world out there that is just waiting for you. And uh, it's actually not just a world out there, it's also a world inside, right? Which is, which is an allusion to the, allusion to the fact that He's talking about the Force, you see. So that sets up both the character's inner and outer conflicts, okay? So inciting incident has to be there. And that also has to be part of the premise statement. So we've got a protagonist, we've got an objective, we've got an inciting incident. Now we need the fourth component, very, very vital, the antagonist, okay? That is the Force. Could be a person, could be something other than a person, could be a robot. It could be the weather, right? Like Jack London's To Build a Fire. The weather, right, is literally... The uh, perfect storm, the the movie and the book. The weather is literally the antagonist, right? The ocean is literally the antagonist, and Jaws, the shark, could be said to be the antagonist. So could the townspeople, who, you know, are very very persnickety about who um, New York, who 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 you know uh, how their town operates. They could also be said to be the antagonist. Okay, so you have the four items: the protagonist, the antagonist the inciting incident, and the objective. So let's take a look at how they work. By the way, one thing that you have to know, uh, Frankie, is that these four elements don't have to be in any particular order. You can mix and match them however you want in the sentence that you craft for your premise. You can put the antagonist first, you can put the premise, uh, the protagonist first, doesn't matter. However you come up with it so that it makes sense. And I'm gonna give you an example of that in just a second right here. For instance, I wrote down for The Karate Kid, which is the uh, film that you asked about, when the students of a cruel martial arts teacher beat up the new kid in town, he must learn karate to stand up for himself. Okay, let's, let's break that down. In this case, the four parts of that whole thing are, who is the protagonist? It's the new kid in town. Who is the antagonist. Well, that's the students of a cruel martial arts teacher. And I like this description a lot because if you listen very, very carefully, or if you look at it when it's written there, the students of a cruel martial arts teacher is actually two antagonists rolled into one. And that's kind of how the movie plays out, right? They have the guy who, uh, Sensei, everybody calls him Sensei, I forget his name in the actual script, but the, the blonde guy who's uh, the Cobra Kai leader he is kind of the head baddie, right? But then all the students who do his bidding, uh, the, the little jackals running around beating up on poor Daniel LaRusso, they are also antagonists, right? So that, end, that mention of the students of a cruel martial arts master gives you a whole wide ranging uh, latitude for the fact that there's gonna be more than one facet to the antagonist. Does that make sense to you? Okay. What's the inciting incident? Well, the, the inciting incident in this case is that the new kid in town right, gets beat up. That's the inciting incident. And if you remember, that's, that, that's the way it happens in the movie. Daniel LaRusso and his mom arrive, I think it's in California, some, I'm pretty sure it's in California someplace. They come from Parsippany. He's kind of fish out of water. That's always a good setup. Um, but everything really doesn't come to a head until that day that he gets beat up by the cruel, uh, by the students of the cruel martial arts master. Okay, so that beating up is the inciting incident. It says to him, hey, shit or get off the pot, kid. It says to him, stand up for yourself or die. It says to him, grow or uh, be defeated. It's the challenge of the movie. You either surpass your current circumstances or you wither and die. Okay, getting beat up is the inciting incident. So what's the objective? Well, the new kid in town must learn karate to stand up for himself. Okay, when the students of a cruel martial arts teacher beat up the new kid in town, he must learn karate to stand up for himself. Now, please note, Frankie, and everybody watching, there, there's no mention, is there any mention in that sentence of Daniel's girlfriend? The, the, uh, uh, Shu? Amanda Shu? What was her name? The actress? Um, is, is there any men mention of her in, in that sentence? No. Is there any mention of 
kindly, old, curmudgeonly Mr. Miyagi, uh, played by Pat Morita. No. Is there any mention of the tournament at the final end of the uh, film, the, you know, the climax where he learns the crane technique and all of that? No. Is there any mention of Mr. Miyagi's family being killed in the war uh, while he's away fighting for America, uh, but they were in a Japanese internment camp, I think it was? No. None of that is in there. Why? And a lot of people get hung up on this, Frankie, so if you get hung up on this, you're in good company. The why of that is that the premise sentence, this statement, these four elements put into one sentence, is the spine of the story, okay? The spine of the story, not the ribs, okay? Not the arms, not the legs, not the appendages, not the things that hang off the spine. The spine is the central column to the entire affair. Without the spine, there can be none of these other things that I just mentioned, the girlfriend, the mom, the, 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 the Mr. Miyagi, the, 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 the tournament at the end, the learning of this arcane crane, crane technique. None of that can be in there unless you have the spine correct. Okay? I, it's like you're kind of like a story chiropractor when you do this work. You have to make sure that the spinal column is stable enough to hold on to everything that you're going to eventually grow off of it. So if you have ideas for the story, you know, your story, jot them down in a notebook or jot them down on a piece of paper and just little thought bubbles, right? What I always do is like, oh, Dan, I'd love to have a scene where this happened. Jot it down. You'll see soon enough whether or not it's spine material or if it's appendage material. And I talk about that in the course. You have to get the spine material correct uh, before you can start hanging things off of it. I mean, ribs, for instance, on a spine, they're very important, right? We have a rib cage that protects our organs and everything like that, our heart, our lungs, our liver. Uh, liver's a little bit lower, but you get the idea. Without the spine, none of that matters. So we have to work on the spine, and the spine is the premise sentence. You don't have to try to pin down too much in a premise statement. Again, just work on the four elements and then put them into some kind of grammatical order and put them into an order that makes somebody go, ooh, ooh, oh, I wonder what happens, and then what happens? When, when somebody keeps asking you, and then what happens, and then what happens, and then what happens, then you've got them hooked, basically, and that's what all good storytellers do, is we don't give too much information too quickly. That's boring. I'll shoot the moon here and say that there, 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 there's two things that you want to do when you're writing a story, and I'll use the written format rather than the visual for this one. Number one, thou shalt not bore. Don't do that. Okay, every page should have some kind of conflict. Every scene, if you're going to go with the film version, should have some advancement of the conflict. Okay, it doesn't have to be overt. It doesn't have to be an explosion or a car chase or a laser battle in space with the Millennium Falcon. It doesn't have to be that, although you know, that's all fair game. But there should be a furtherance of the conflict in every single um, either scene or moment or page that keeps the audience moving, okay? That always says, ah, this is essential, you got to pay attention to it. And by the way, when you finish your story in whatever format, if you go back through it and you say, I don't know, do we need the scene? You don't need it. If you're asking yourself, do we need it? You probably don't need it. Okay, so you want to cut it, and if there is something in there that you, that you really, really need, you want to find a better way to make it absolutely essential, right, and, and to heighten the conflict. Again, thou shalt not bore is kind of a, a good lesson to go by. Again, the mailbag is going to be full of people saying, oh, you know, you're, you're, you know what about slow-moving, thoughtful pieces? You're right. You're absolutely right. There are slow, slower-moving, more thoughtfully paced stories. There just are. However, uh, for the most part, I think it'd probably be best to learn how to write something uh, exciting and compelling before challenging uh, a reader or a viewer with something a little bit more daring. Okay, Ultimately, you should be able to do both, but you certainly shouldn't bore somebody without intending to bore them, if that makes sense. Okay, Whatever you do, make it intentional. You have to know what you're doing at all times as a storyteller. If you're putting a piece of information in there, it has to be in there for a reason. If it's not in there, it's not just because you forgot it or didn't think about it. No, you thought about it and then you said, it's best for the story if I don't put that in there now and I put it over here or I leave it out. Okay, everything has to have an intention. 
That's very difficult for some storytellers to grasp. It was very hard for me to grasp. But when you're getting into the business of story, you have to be 100% intentional in everything that you do. Okay. So when you want to involve these ribs, uh, Mr. Miyagi, uh, the girlfriend, uh, the tournament, the crane technique, right? All of these things into your premise. When, when, when you're trying to essentially take your premise and blow it out, right, into not just a one sentence, but into maybe five or six sentences, into a paragraph, which is what we do in the course, and from a paragraph into five paragraphs, okay, again, that's the next evolution, and from five paragraphs into, I don't know, two, three pages sometimes, and then from two or three pages, if you want to, you can go as, I mean, I've gone as long as 30 pages in a, in a single, uh, what we call an outline or a treatment. You, you do that by asking yourselves, yourself a, a, a series of questions that are centered around how. How does the new kid in town learn karate? That's right there in your premise statement, but now you ask yourself, well, how does he learn karate? Well, that gives you your next way to write in the outline, the next step that you're gonna take. Well, he meets this kindly, he's not actually kindly, he's very curmudgeonly, uh, karate master, a Japanese American, who is a master of the form his particular form from Okinawa. And so that gives you ideas, right? And you say, well, well how, how does the old man teach him? Well, he teaches him by, you know, the wax on, the wax off, and the um, paint up and paint down. And so when we ask ourselves, when we, once we have the spine going through, once we have the premise uh, statement, asking ourselves a, a, a series of hows is incredibly compelling. It's going to give, it's, it's like a magic key. You turn the key in the lock and all of a sudden the story just comes bursting out of it. How did the protagonist come, become the new kid in town, you might ask, after reading my premise statement? And I would say, uh, well, because his mom and, and his father got divorced and his mom followed I forget what the reason was, her muse or whatever it was, and, and she took him all the way across a uh, country from Parsippany, New Jersey. I remember that part because I grew up in New Jersey, all the way to Los Angeles, I think it was, in some place in California, okay? Is that really a part of the necessary part of the story? No, and that's why it's not in the premise statement. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a detail that comes out. The most important, the saliable, the actable, the uh, writable detail is that Daniel LaRusso is a fish out of water. That's the thing that has to be in there, and that's kind of introduced by the simple uh, moniker of he's the new kid in town. Okay? Does that make any sense to you, Frankie? I hope it makes sense to you, and I hope it makes sense to anybody watching. This is how we work from general to specific. This is how we take a story idea and we work on it. We carve it out very, very, very assiduously, making meticulously, working, 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 putting all of that effort in up front so that when it is time to actually write the story, you know everything that you need to know. You've already done all of the work. Now, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, I don't want to write an outline. That's boring. I know everything, and I always write to uh, figure out what happens as it goes along. And I say, that's fantastic. If you're, if you're doing that and you're comfortable with it, that's great. I'm not trying to change that. However, if you're like me, the way I was, okay, and you're finding that's not working for you, you need a little bit more information up front, well, the outlining, the story-breaking technique gives you a framework that you can begin to write from, okay? It's not answering every single one of your questions, although it can, but the beautiful thing about writing, I find, is that you could have a great story idea. You can develop it. You can put it into a 30-page treatment. You can have everything nailed down. You're still going to improvise your butt off when it comes to writing that thing. That's just the nature of the beast. And of course, if you're writing and a better idea occurs to you, you're going to pursue that. So it's not a binomial thing. It's not zeros and ones. It's not plotter versus pantser. No. It's actually a very nice mixture of the two. It's just that I found in my own case, and perhaps in yours too, that I was not spending enough time front-loading the work. I wasn't doing enough plotting, so to speak. And by plotting, I also mean charactering and theming and premising and uh, conflicting, right? All of that's got to be in there. I was kind of letting that go and think, well, I'll stumble into that later. And that's why a lot of my early stories were not selling. They were not taking off. 
Nobody wanted to read them. And I was getting lost in them and I was wasting time. I don't want that to happen to you. So don't worry, I would say to you about, oh, I don't want to write an outline. I have writers say that to me all the time. I can't stand writing an outline. You know, it's boring, boring, boring. Actually, I disagree with you entirely. Writing an outline is just as exciting because you're doing all that work up front. Who's going to hit the, the, the protagonist here? What, what obstacles are they going to face? Set all that stuff up. That's, that's exciting work. That's really, really exciting work. And it's very challenging. And I'm going to be tough love with you for a second, right? Tough love writer. I think the reason that most writers don't do a break your story exercise is because they're just too lazy. They don't want to get into it. They don't want to, they don't want to test the story and poke it and prod it and make sure that it is absolutely as exciting and as satisfying. It's got all the setups. It's got all the payoffs. It's got all the, the really, really good juice in there that makes the story great. They don't want to do that uh, because they either haven't been educated enough to know how that's done or they're relying on this false narrative that they can somehow find their way through the wilderness on their own. Don't do that. Okay? Don't. Educate yourself. Learn a technique. Practice the technique. It's like a muscle, right? The more you exercise the muscle, the more you can look at a, a film or you can read a book and you can say, mm, that's really working well. Or, oh, that, uh, I don't know why this uh, writer is just spending so much time on this because we've already covered this material before. If I were the editor, I would have cut that out. You know, uh, it will definitely make your work stronger every time you go to do a project because you're gaining experience. And that's what you want to do as a writer. It's what you want to do in any profession. Experience counts. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? So, Frankie, thank you so much uh, for your letter and uh, for your questions. I've actually built a lot of this stuff into um, uh, the assignments that are in the Break Your Story course. And you can find the link to the Break Your Story course right down below. If you have questions about a story or about a uh, story technique, or about the writing process in general, by all means, send them to me uh, via createx3.com, or you can just put them in the comments down below, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, work them into some of these videos as we go along. Thank you so much for your time. It's really a, a, a great pleasure talking about the things that I love with you. Again, my name is Damon DeMarco for createx3.com. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay creative.